We now come to the time where John the Baptist comes on uh, to the scene. I'm going to read from the uh, third chapter, starting at the first verse of the Gospel of St. Matthew. Hear the word of the Lord. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of the word. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you'd open our hearts and our minds, that not only would we be hearers of your word, but that we would be doers of your word. Um, this is an amazing uh, passage of scripture. There's so much in it, it's really hard to take it apart and get through the whole thing. But I'm gonna try to go through it a little bit and see what we can uh, kind of feel took place back when it happened and how we can put ourselves into that picture and see how we can, uh, what we can learn from it and see if it might change us in any kind of way, shape, or form. Because in our preparation for this coming of Christ, the birth of Jesus, we need to make some changes if it's going to really get into our hearts in the way God has called it to happen for us. Now you see here when he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The word repent simply means we're going to change. We're going to make a change. We're going to change direction. The way and the things that we used to do are no longer the things that should be done. Now that's a, that's a scary message, is it not? I, I have a clip on there, but I, I don't have the right sound on that on it. But I don't know if you have seen the uh, commercial for GE, where they have this funny blue little guy with a big and ugly tail that's born and no one wants to be around it. And it walks out of the hospital and everybody rejects it. And the more it goes, the dirtier it gets and sleeps in the street and his tail is all filthy and people look at it and just in disgust and try to get away from it. And then finally it comes up to this door and it says GE over the door. And then this person comes out and welcomes, welcomes this little blue fellow with the ugly tail in. And the next thing you know, this little blue fellow with a peacock tail like and all color and beautiful and the light shining on him steps out on stage and everyone's clapping. And it's about the imagination of new ideas. New ideas are always scary. New ideas leave us wondering where to take the next step. But this is what the scripture is telling us. It doesn't have to be scary. We can put our feet out, we can move out, we can do the things we really feel God is calling us to do. We can make those changes. Our hearts can be open no matter how closed they may have been. We can have prejudice, we can have bigotry, we can have hatred, we can have all of those things. I know that I'm hoping we don't all have all of those things all together in abundance, 
But I think there are times when we get tired, there's times when we get frustrated, there's times when things aren't going right, there's times when people abuse us, there's times when we don't get our way. Some of those things come out. Sure I will vouch, they come out of me. Yeah, it's amazing how easy it is to get in trouble. Do you realize that? Cheryl and I had a little disagreement. <laughs> yeah, we were going back and forth, back and forth. And finally, you know, I thought I'd close this down in an appropriate way. So I said, Cheryl, I would agree with you, but then we would both be wrong. Wow, <laughs> maybe not the right thing to say. <laughs> you know, and she immediately told me I was in a doghouse and I had to gain points to get out. <laughs> Well, these are the things we have to change. There are so many things that we have to change. And the thing about the scripture is it's telling us that the kingdom of God is near and we have to make straight the pathway. That we are the ones who are responsible to be able to be the witnesses, the ones that walk and carry the light and the ones who make the modifications and the adjustments in our life to take on this new, exciting, but scary new thing. Because it can be scary to commit yourself 100% to something. And Jesus Christ is coming. Jesus Christ is here. The Holy Spirit surrounds us. And we have a mandate to do the work that we have been given. So how, where do we start? Well, we already started with the Word of God right here. And we, we remind it, it is in fact the Word of God. It's not something that someone's picked up from WikiLeaks. It's not something that we find on Wikipedia. It's not something on fact check on the internet. It comes from the prophet of God. The Word comes through the prophet. We read from Isaiah that the shoot from the stump of Jesse would come. That is what Jesus is. Ancestor, Jesse is the ancestor of Jesus. And then we read also, if I can find it, the New Testament prophecy, which is just as strong. And this, this comes from the New Testament Zechariah, that is uh, John the Baptist's father. Then the father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. He said, and you, child, talking about John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For he will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet onto the way of peace. Guide our feet on the way to peace. And so we have 800 years before the birth of Christ. We have two passages of scripture that lead us into this prophecy. And from Zechariah, the prophet of the New Testament, we have also the prophet telling us that there is one who's going to come that must come before, but is not greater than the one who comes after, which is Jesus. And he is the messenger. And whenever John the Baptist came out of that wilderness, he came out giving it his all. Now, he might look kind of funny coming out of there with that camel hair suit that he had on with a you know, piece of cord or leather tied around his belt with his beard full of ants and whatever else was crawling in him from laying in the desert. Now, the thing about John, about being out in the desert, The scripture tells us that after John had his eighth day and was blessed in the temple, he was taken out to the wilderness and that he lived in the wilderness until this time came for this proclamation. Wow. John lived his entire life in isolation, preparing to give this message. He spent the hot days of the desert the cold nights of the desert, the isolation to take away the filters that pull, would pull him away from God, remembering the stories that he is being taught, remembering where he has seen other people, 
uh, his father, uh, work in the temple before of his eighth birthday, all of the things he did, he sat there preparing himself for this moment in time. And this is our moment in time. And a really great thing about this, this from Zechariah's prophecy, he says that we lead with the light to peace. You know, it's, it's hard sometimes because we get ideas in our head uh, we get our own positions, and obviously we get ourselves in trouble with our own positions. And we have John the Baptist coming here, and as soon as he sees the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he says, you brood of vipers. Now, you don't make friends calling people broods of vipers. I've even noticed on Facebook, I get blasted off the page a lot because I think I'm telling the truth, and other people take it as... Well, I don't know what they take it as. They don't like it. But at any rate, we have to be prepared for that because the scripture tells us that we are to bring about peace. Peace, as it is written, shalom in the Old Testament, the Latin and the Greek has changed it to other translations. And under the English, we have... Uh, translated peace, but it loses some of its power when we do that. Shalom means the unconquerable benevolence and goodwill and love and grace to all. That we only really want nothing but the very best for other people. That we cannot be content if the other people do not have what makes for their very best in life. And that Shalom says that we need to wrap around them with that love. We need to be able to encourage them with that grace. We need to take the unconquerable benevolence, which is uh, total and complete grace, regardless, without judgment, and give the forgiveness and bind the wounds and raise the people and walk with the others. And, and it doesn't mean that's just Christians. It means everybody, because God did so love the world. And through this process, we grow. We grow and we grow and we change. It's amazing to me how stuck people can get in old ways and in their old interpretations of what God is saying. We need to believe that we have a living word, a word that changes over time. That God doesn't change, but our interpretation of God's word changes. I was, uh, got an email and I was thinking, this, this I think makes the point. Uh, you know how we look back and say about the good old days and how wonderful they were? And some people think of the, I don't know, 40s, 50s. And we think everybody was in church and every relationships and families were so close. Well, I happened to pick up something from May of 1955, Housekeeping Monthly published an article. It's entitled The Good Wife's Guide. Now, I can't read all 18 of these things. It would take too long. But I'll, I'll read a couple, a few of them. Have dinner ready and plan ahead, even the night before, to have a delicious meal ready on time for his return. This is the way of letting him know that you have been thinking about him and are concerned about his needs. Most men are hungry when they come home, and the prospect of a good meal, especially his favorite dish, is part of the warm welcome needed. These are good tips. <laughs> Prepare yourself. Take 15 minutes to rest so you'll be refreshed when he arrives. Touch up your makeup. Put a ribbon in your hair and be fresh looking. He has just been with a lot of work weary people. He doesn't want to look at you. Be a, here's where language really kind of goes off. Be a little gay and a little more interesting for him. His boring day may need a lift. One of your duties is to provide it. We don't need to take that literally or we could bust up the family very quickly. <laughs> Be 
comes home, there's two women there waiting for him. <laughs> clear, away, <laughs> clear away the clutter. Make one last trip through the main part of the house just before your husband arrives. Gather up the school books, the toys, the papers, etc., and then run a dust cloth over the tables. <laughs> I'm going to skip ahead to some of these. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I know there's a couple I, I have to pass along. Children are little treasures, and he would like to see them playing the part. I mean, they've got to play a part. <laughs> Minimize the noise. At the time of his arrival, eliminate all noise of the washer, dryer, or vacuum. Try to encourage the children to be quiet. Oh. <sighs> <laughs> well, it, it would sound that way, but here, here's one. Don't complain if he's late home for dinner, even if he stays out all night. <laughs> Count this as a minor compared to what he might have been going through that day. You know, he might have been frustrated that day. <laughs> Arrange his pillow, offer to take off his shoes, speak in a low and soothing, pleasant voice. And the last one is really cool. A good wife always knows her place. This is 1955. I have been, and Shirley has been too, at weddings that were of rather fundamentalist nature, where the wife was told to remember that a full quiver of arrows, which means a million children, would be her duty. <laughs> and that she has now entered into a new relationship and she must be obedient to her husband. And both of us like fall out of our chairs in Huntington <laughs> Crown. <laughs> but I, I suggest and, and I'm not saying that I deny someone their faith, and I really don't mean that. But I mean we have a living word. I believe we evolve in our understanding of that word, in the knowledge of the word, the application of the word, and what the true message was meant to be to us. And that is shalom, peace, the unconquerable benevolence, the goodwill that goes to the wife as well as it does to the world. And the wife to the husband, the same unconquerable benevolence and good will, wrapped in the love of God. And that might change the way we look at those past scriptures and, this, the, and the way the relationships are formed and, and the ones we accept and the ones we reject. I don't see in the scripture where any person anywhere in this world is rejected by God. I just don't see it. No one in this world should be rejected from our embrace. And that's what the scripture tells us. And that change is scary to a lot of people. But that is the call of Christ. And I'll just end it with, amen. I'm so glad I got to pass those tips along to y'all.